All right, hey, hey everybody. How many of you guys want to be the hero of your company? How many of you are the hero of your company already? It's probably the truth. Um, I'm going to give you some practical tips today by kind of airing some dirty laundry about problems that we've had, how we've solved them, and things that you can do. Um, I realize that some of you probably don't run your own infrastructure like we do. You may use Amazon or something else, but I think that the principles still apply. Um, there's more questions to come. So heroes, get thumbs up. That's what we want at the end of this. Here's some background on me. Uh, basically, I worked at Engineard for a couple years. I was one of the first support managers, actually one of the first support engineers there. Um, then I became a support manager. Then as we grew, I got to become a director. It was a lot of fun, and it taught me a lot of different things. Um, for those of you who somehow aren't familiar with Engineard, they've got basically a platform as a service cloud um, that they've morphed over the years into supporting Amazon um, and Terramark, and I'm not sure who else these days. Uh, it's much like Heroku. Uh, in the early days when Rails was kind of new and no one knew how to deploy it, they figured it out, um, which meant that when Groupon grew like 20% every day and their whole site was falling over, we were there to help them figure out how to make that not happen. Um, I'm saying all this just to, to give you some background that I really do have credentials um, and experience with big sites, and it's not just like me giving you some tips that you know, don't, that I don't practice myself. Um, today I'm at 37 Signals, and obviously we have Basecamp, Campfire, High Rise. I'm sure most of you guys are familiar with those. Um, to give you an idea of the scale of Campfire, or actually Basecamp, we're doing about 20,000 requests per minute, and we're sending about 2 million emails a day. Um, there's thousands and thousands of REST jobs that kick off, and we, uh, we actually just turned up our second data center. We're not live out of both of them, but we've got a couple hundred servers split across two sites right now. Here's our, uh, our status site. It's actually pretty. It's really nice. The designer spent a lot of time. We redid it this year. And I'm going to tell you guys something. We're never going to win an award for having a great status site. And as a matter of fact, I don't ever want our users to go to the status site. Because when they've gone to the status site, we've failed already. Status sites represent downtime. And I want you guys to be able to avoid that. Um, Three nines is actually not that much. I don't know if you guys saw the, the first slide, but basically everybody in this room should be able to hit three nines without any problems. This is the Basecamp uptime report. Uh, I took this screenshot yesterday, I think. So we're at four nines, barely hanging in there right now. Um, my point is, we can do it with Basecamp. It was a ground up rewrite. This is for the new version of Basecamp. Um, and no one does ground up rewrites, right? No one like rewrites their major app. We did it, and we've done it successfully in terms of the uptime, too. And if we can do it, I promise you guys can do it. I will say this. We probably have one of the best op team, ops teams around. I mean, kudos to GitHub and the other guys, but I'm a little biased. I think the guys at the bottom of that screen do a tremendous job, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later. One more thing. This is cheating. <coughs> Scheduled maintenance is cheating. When you tell your users, oh, go hit this site and uh, you know, look and see if Sunday afternoon, if we're going to be up, Cheating. Don't do that. Salesforce, I, I can't believe they still get away with it these days. Here we go. Why does this matter to you specifically? You're probably responsible for the primary method of your own website being up and available, and your boss probably told you something like, hey, guys, I always want the site to work. Do whatever it takes. I'm sure you've heard those words. How many of you guys monitor your site's uptime using something like Pingdom? Basically everybody. How many, know, how many of you already know that you've hit three nines? Or you're under three nines? You guys should pay attention. <laughs> the, uh, the Fortune 500 um, was measured by Dunn and Bradstreet last year. 50% of them had basically greater than 1.6 hours of downtime per week. Almost two hours of downtime per week. And they estimated the cost to be about $896,000 every week. That translates into like $48 million a year. I don't know about you guys, but I'd love to have $48 million. Here, let's do a little quiz. There's three companies up there. Who can tell me how much downtime a Sisley had in 2012? Just take a guess. Throw out a number. Give me some minutes. Two days. Two days? More. Actually, it's not two days. It's, 11, it's, it's about 1,200 minutes in 2012. Not to pick on GitHub. Sorry, Jesse, the rest of you guys. But anybody want to take a wag at GitHub? I'll give you a hint. It's better. They did a better job. About 640 minutes in 2012. And how about McDonald's in just the last three months? Anybody want to take a guess? <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't guess either. Less than two nines of uptime in just the last three months. My point is, this takes a lot of work. Let's uh, go over some terms really quick. 
The definitions there are basically the same, but what I wanted to point out is that the difference is between uptime and availability is your site can be up but unavailable. In other words, everything can be working fine, but your users might not get to it. For the purpose of the presentation, I'm going to kind of cheat and mix those two together. Maybe some of you guys have a configuration that looks like this. This is what we did at 37 Signals when I joined. We had two full racks of equipment. We deployed a bunch of stuff on Ubuntu. We ran CI and integration tests. We had Nagios configured. We did health checks for every app. Uh, we used commercial NFS storage on Isilon. We had smart hands at the data center. Basically, my point is we thought we were doing everything right and basically the best that it could be done. The unfortunate truth is that when I joined, we got paged almost every single day. We only had a couple hundred Nagios alerts. They weren't much use because by the time we got them, the site was already down. And honestly, we were kind of running around with our heads cut off. It gets better, though. Here's a question. What's significant about 200 days? Anybody know? Yes, that's true. What's significant about 200 days is that at about 197 days, all of our servers started rebooting or basically just hanging. I'm talking about database servers, application servers, Redis, Memcached, everything. They literally were just going, I don't know where, off to La La Land. And we weren't getting Nagios alerts. Uh, we were getting site down pages. And this basically caused a ton of turmoil in the company. You know, why is this happening? Is it 196 days that we need to reboot the server? Is it 201 days? We honestly didn't know. So my point is, obscure kernel bugs will rob you of uptime. Everybody thinks that Ubuntu 10.04 is stable, but the truth is even that has bugs. So you have to do something to prepare yourself for that inevitability, right? So what we did was we said, hey, what is the root cause of the problem? Well, the root cause of the problem is that we can't control the kernel versions, we can't debug everything all the time, right? But we can take steps to prepare ourselves for that. So we said, okay, what's the most important key for uptime for us? It's database servers, it's memcache, those are huge single points of failure that you can't easily duplicate or scale. And we decided we move them to RHEL and CentOS. I think Will said something like, you just use what works. Well, those just work for us. We knew that we didn't experience the 200-day uptime bug on those, and it was an easy change. This is our uh, original network architecture. Some of you might be familiar with that. Basically, my point with this is we made some choices at the beginning that came back uh, that we needed to revisit. We had two stack switches. I know there's four there. We had two stack switches at the top of every cabinet. We ran a, a basically a network that looked like a gigantic loop, and we counted on spanning tree and other technologies like that to block one of the connections so that if you know, someone at the data center accidentally bumped a Cat5 cable or accidentally, which has happened multiple times, unplugged one of the, the power supplies for the switches, um, things would keep on working. But the truth is, well, does anybody know how spanning tree works like at a low level? It sends out messages saying these links are up or these links are down, and then it holds those down. And when, one, when the port changes, it floods the network to tell everything, hey, you know, go around this way, don't go that way anymore. The problem is these things were supposed to work, and they never, ever, ever worked for us. I can't tell you how many times we would say, hey, can you guys go uh, swap out the server? And in the process of pulling the server out, someone would unplug something, one of the switches, and Cisco's documentation says, oh, hey, you know, stack switches, they work fine if one gets unplugged. In reality, what would happen is one would get unplugged and they would just stop working totally. The other one wouldn't do anything. The same thing with our spanning tree configuration. We had all these cabinets in a row and they were all interconnected to the left and the right. But the reality is when one of them, when one stack got rebooted in the middle, the whole network basically just hung up. My point is, there's a way to do switching right at scale and we hadn't done that. So here's what we did. We said, OK, there's new technology out there. It's called virtual link trunking. Some of you may have heard of it as MLAG and Cisco speak. Um, it's basically the idea of spanning tree. It, it's basically spanning tree on steroids. It gives you the added capacity, and it gives you the fault tolerance. The truth is, we should have had virtual link trunking or something like that in our original design. It just didn't exist. But we could have engineered around that, and we chose not to make that decision. I wasn't there. I don't know why. We also made another, if you look back here, we also made another bad decision. Does anybody know why this is bad? Like why this topology is bad at a basic level? Who knows networking? Why is it bad? Okay, yes, that was a problem. We'll get there. <laughs> um, the, other, the other bad thing is that 
basically packets, if you imagine flattening that out, packets had to go through a bunch of different switches to get to the other end, which made no sense. A more common topology would be a hub and spoke with some core set of infrastructure and then everything hung off of that. Well, we went to the hub and spoke topology and we also went to switches that had multiple power supplies. The truth is all that it required was time and money and better engineering. And my point is, a lot of times we get stuck in the idea that the way we have things are already the best practice, but the truth is it wasn't the best practice for us. I don't know, again, how many of you guys manage the network, but it's something to think about. There's another problem, though, with switches. Humans make errors. We actually had to come up with a little knife uh, plug-in for ourselves that basically allowed us to type you know, 10 words and get a, hundred, a couple hundred words out so that we could copy and paste them into our config. Now, I'm sure, just like everybody else, you guys probably have your configs under version control. We do, too. But version control doesn't stop typos, and it doesn't stop mistakes. And the cool thing is, when we do it like this, and we use the data that's in Chef, as long as the data going into Chef, which hypothetically is good, the data coming out is good. Um, I can't impress upon you guys enough how much simple changes like this will affect your uptime. It, this just eliminated a whole category of mistakes and problems for us. This is the internet. Everybody knows it's a series of tubes, I assume. Um, the truth is, though, all tubes are not created equal, and all internet providers are not created equal. What's the number one thing that determines the reachability of your site? Anybody have a guess? Speak up, Jesse. Yeah, you. OK. What's between the user and, and your servers? The ISP, exactly. So we, uh, we had a little trouble with the internet one day. Actually, we had a lot of trouble with the internet multiple days. What would happen is we would be good net citizens out there doing our thing, and someone else would get a massive attack, or somebody between us and the user would decide to do a scheduled maintenance and then botch that, or do an unscheduled maintenance and botch that. And in the middle of the day, our site would be down for two hours, when in reality, all of our, everything on our end was fine, but our users couldn't get there. My point is, I don't think it's acceptable today to allow other people to have control over the main thing that makes you money, right? So we had to take that back a little bit. Now, everybody will tell you that, hey, you know, doing the internet is hard, doing BGP is hard. Here's five steps to do this. Add multiple tubes, basically. Step one, find another provider. There's a lot of them. Step two, get yourself a, a step, like a slash 24 from IANA. Costs a couple thousand dollars, I think. Connect to both of your providers, pretty easy. And then profit, be the hero. There's nothing to do after that. Here's the entirety of our original BGP config, like on one router. How many lines is that? It's six lines, basically. Anybody know about BGP? Or do I need to explain really quick? OK, basically, it's the way the internet works. That's the short version. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll go a little in depth there. So the first line basically says that this is our ASN number. In other words, this is the number that uni uniquely identifies us on the internet to other routers. Um, the second line says, hey, when something happens, log that change so that we can debug it. The third line says, if there's link, if there's routes out there that are going up and down because someone's doing maintenance or there's another problem, don't use those routes for some period of time. It's configurable, but basically that's the general gist. The fourth line says, hey, this is the network that we're going to use on the internet, so our IP addresses are going to be something like 204.37.99.10 or whatever. And then the next two lines basically say, this is who we're directly connecting to, or this is our peer, and that's their identifier. As you can see, that's actually XO. So this right here, you don't need a CCNA. You don't need to be a CCIE. I promise any of you could Google this and do this in two seconds. What is this? All your eggs in one basket. Someone, asked, someone said about single data center. It's a no. Basically, I've heard a lot of things like don't put all your engineers in the same cab, don't let everybody take the same flight. The general gist is we did exactly this and we knew that we were doing it and we thought it was okay. When we designed the original layout for Basecamp, we bought a little bit of space at the data center and we put everything into two cabinets and it worked at that point, it was just fine. The problem is once you actually need to do maintenance in one of those cabinets, you're gonna take out a huge chunk of your capacity, right? Today, we've learned that that's probably not such a great idea, and that technology allows you to spread that load out, right? So I don't know how many of you guys buy your own hardware. Show of hands. Well, more than I thought. Yay, Jesse. Um, there's a, we bought Dell R710s. They're basically 4U servers. They're big servers. And they were really powerful. We could run tons of Ruby on Rails processes on them. The problem is we had so few servers that if we lost any one, we lost a huge chunk of our capacity. 
So today what we did was we got out of the all eggs in one basket by buying basically blade servers, effectively. They're not really blades. You can Google it's uh, Dell C5000 servers. And so you can get eight or 12 servers in two or three U of space, which means that you can stagger those servers across the, the entire footprint and spread out that load. Again, this is something that we just didn't consider at the beginning. And when you look at it after the fact and you think, hey, I want to do maintenance without causing downtime, again, very easy to do. Um, for those of you with cloud environments, I was trying to think how this would apply to you. Uh, you could do two availability zones. You could do two production environments and load balance across them. You could use something like GSLB from Dynact where they do health checking for DNS. And if your site goes down in one, you flip over to the other. It's the same principle to be applied there. This is my dog, Ruby. Just had to throw that in since her name's really Ruby. All right, so scalability counts in all this too, right? Your API is not scalable. How many of you think your API is scalable? It's not, good. Uh, I can't tell you the number of times that we've had trouble at 37 Signals because we didn't have sufficient API rate limiting. And it's never malicious intent. It's just people that write broken event machine scripts. It's people that leave test things running at the office overnight and somehow they spiral out of control. The truth is though, we probably have prevented, I don't know, 10 or 20 outages recently just from throttling API requests. Everybody here, rack, th rack throttle on GitHub. I think uh, there was a presentation this morning, someone else mentioned something. I don't know what it was, but there's a lot of Ruby libraries that help you do this. And the truth is, it makes it really easy to prevent the downtime. Simple, easy win. The DAW database stuff. How many of you guys feel like you have a handle on how to scale MySQL? That's like three people, wow. Okay, uh, I'm gonna give you some tips, listen up. Don't be wooed by synchronous replication. How many of you guys have heard of Galera or per Percona Extra DB cluster? How many of you are using it? None, wow, okay. Um, we made a mistake. We used Schooner SQL, which is now defunct. They got bought by Standis and killed the product. Um, and it was a synchronous replication solution. And the idea was, hey, our database will always be available. If something happens, we'll just swap over to the other one. There's no delay, everything happens magically. The truth is, what really happened was we would go to do something like take a backup on the database server, and then the master server would fall over. Since it was synchronous replication, it also was basically synchronous I.O. Um, I'm not trying to dig any of the existing implementations, but as far as I know, none of them have solved that, so I would be weary. Um, another thing, how many of you guys plan ahead for database failures? Like, who has a plan, and they're just gonna execute the second that master database falls over? a single person in the room. This is not good. Here's a, here's a good analysis for you. Decide now, before something happens, whether you value the integrity of your data more or the availability of your site more. We, a number of times, got into sticky situations where it was kind of like the host was down, but maybe it would be up in a couple more minutes, and the truth is we lost precious nines of uptime because we didn't make a decision fast, because we hadn't decided that. You know, is it better to let the server reboot and let the binary log recover? I don't know, that's a decision you're gonna have to make, but it's a big trade-off when you're actually considering your uptime. Another thing is the schema design. How many of you guys spend time, as like the ops people, spend time helping the developers actually understand how indexes work, what trade-offs there are in schema design for Rails applications? Like two people, guys, this is a huge win. There's an excellent, excellent, excellent presentation by Percona um, if you look at their 2011 keynote thing, it's right there at the top. I'll send the link out of, uh, on my Twitter if you guys want to find it. But basically, developers have to understand how their decisions in designing the schema impact the availability of your site. For instance, let's say that a developer needs to serialize some uh, YAML, and they decide that you know, it's going to be a couple hundred lines long, and so they're just going to add a text column to do that. Well, there's probably nothing wrong with that to begin with. But there is something wrong with it if you understand it operationally. That table that used to have pretty fast sorts for the data is now gonna be like two or three times as slow because MySQL changes the algorithm that it uses to do the sort. Again, it's just a little tiny thing, but it has a huge impact on your uptime. I can't tell you how many times we've seen issues where there's this like slow creep. Everything's fine, it still looks fine, it still looks fine, and then boom, we have a big problem. And it's a lot of times just decisions like this. Finally, there's one thing that you can do to be the DAW database hero. What's that? You can spend money. 
build your database way bigger than you think it is, and then you will not have problems. It's really easy to do, but it's very hard to convince other people in the organization to do it. I'm saying spend money on Fusion IO, buy extra memory, hire Percona to go through and tune your stuff for you. It really does make a huge difference in your uptime. All right, let's talk about application server capacity. How many of you guys proactively take hosts out of your load balancer or however you serve your app to see how well your site will function? <laughs> Again, only a few of you. Yeah, this is a great idea. Take web servers down so you know where the limit is before the web servers fail on their own. This helps you avoid things like bad deploys to a certain number of your hosts taking your site down, things like that. Um, I can't tell you at Engine Yard in the early days how many people made this mistake where they provisioned their cluster to be just big enough to serve the traffic that they had now so they could save some money. And then all of a sudden, NBC ran a five second thing about their website and everybody hit it once and psh, it tanked. Easy to do, just disable a couple hosts, watch your metrics, go back. All right, metrics, always be measuring. Um, this is a little snapshot from our internal dashboard. I think it's showing Basecamp or something like that. But I wanna reinforce this. There is never too much data. There's problems storing too much data, but there's never too much data. Um, we, give our, we did not give ourselves the opportunities in the early days to have enough data to know what to do. So for instance, we couldn't answer questions like, how many REST jobs can we run at once before our database is out of available connections? How many emails can we send in one minute? How many emails can we receive in one minute? What timeouts do we have configured for Memcache and Redis? Another huge outage causing thing. Um, basically, each of the metrics that we collected get turned into a graph, and we do that via something called Flyash, uh, F-L-Y-A-S-H. It's on GitHub, or will be shortly. Yes? Going. Um, it's not just about numbers. This is another thing, 37signal slash critter, you can get it on GitHub. Basically, we instrumented all of our applications now so that they show you what application is, what controller it is, and what action is. That way, when you go look at the database and you look at your slow query log, the hint is already there about where the slow query is coming from. Alerts. Uh, hypothetically, you guys all are collecting a lot of data and you're doing a lot of alerting. We built ourselves a campfire bot so that we can see things in real time as they happen. This is a lot better than getting the page on your phone two minutes later when the site is already down, right? The other thing is you can build tools to actually manage these alerts so that it's easier to acknowledge them or it's easy to annotate them so that the guy that comes along behind you knows what's going on when there's a problem a day later. Uh, Nathan Martz of Twitter, I saw this the other day, he did a fantastic blog post. He said, when something unexpected happens in production, it's critical to have thorough monitoring in place so that you can figure out what happened. As software hardens more and more, unexpected events will get more and more infrequent, and reproducing those events will become harder and harder. So when one of those unexpected events happens, you want as much data about the event as possible. I thought that was kind of counterintuitive. You want more data versus less data when something actually happens. Um, we use Campfire, obviously, all day. Qbot has a cousin that it doesn't know called Tally, and Tally gives us information. So we have, like, basically 10 simple commands that when we get a Nagios alert, we can type those into Campfire, and we immediately get a paste with the information we need. This saves us time from going and SSHing. It doesn't, no one has to know exactly where to look. It makes it a lot easier to access the data. My, uh, my basic gist with this is, you guys should write tools in Ruby that are easy to maintain, because half of these things didn't exist weeks ago or months ago, and people just added them on demand because it was so easy to do. All right, making maintenance a non-event. I assume everybody knows about continuous integration, staging, betas, production, right? Everybody always deploys CI, staging, beta, and then production too, right? No, didn't think so. Um, how hard is it to type cap staging deploy? Apparently really hard, especially when it precedes cap production deploy. Um, bad deployments are a sign of a weak operational efficiency and a weak operational rigor. I don't even need this data probably for you guys, but I would predict that probably about 20% of our outages happen because we do bad deploys. So automate the deploys, make sure CI runs first, always use staging and do thorough testing. I think you'll save yourself a lot of nines. Uh, we use Ruby to make elegant scripts that do dirty work. I don't know how many of you guys use HAProxy, but if you use the stat socket on HAProxy, you can like set hosts into maintenance and things like that. The problem is the syntax is really confusing. So we wrote a little helper script basically. We can call it from Capistrano. We can do other things with it. But basically, it eliminates people making errors again, and it makes it easy to do maintenance online. 
How many of you guys have trouble with rolling back bad deploys? No one, it's just us, I guess. Uh, I can't tell you how many times we've had these questions come up at the like worst possible time, which is like, the site is down, what do I do? Or my bundle's broken, or any other things. Um, teaching developers how to roll back is probably as important as how to deploy. That's all I'll say about that, Let's keep going. Um, cool tool, MySQL roll swap. It does everything you do by hand. It's configurations managed by Chef, and it, does, it takes, does things in seconds instead of minutes. How many of you guys actually fail over databases in production? A lot, yep, that's basically everybody. How many steps are there? I won't enumerate them all, but I wrote down 20, like checking the bin log position, setting read only, checking the bin log position again, moving IP addresses, all that kind of stuff. Um, MySQL role swap is available on GitHub. It's written in Ruby. There's lots of you who have contributed to it already. And it basically takes what used to be an error-prone minute-long process and makes it a second-long process. With this tool, we can swap databases basically live, and our users don't know. Um, another component of that is intermission. We, uh, it's basically an Nginx Open Resty Lua script. I don't know how many of you guys know about the Open Resty build, but basically there's an Nginx build that allows you to have an embedded Lua interpreter. And so uh, I wrote a little series of functions that basically allow us to pause traffic, do database magic on the back end, and then unpause the traffic. And so, again, no downtime to the user, they just see a slow request. That's all it takes. Like, this is a typical maintenance for us now. Knife pause, BCX, BCX is a new version of Basecamp. Uh, swap the database, master and slave, do a restart of the unicorn so they reconnect to the right IP and then unpause the application. It takes like 30 seconds, 40 seconds. Users never know anything. PT online schema change, zero downtime migrations. Um, how many of you guys have used this? Awesome. Yeah, do not be afraid of this tool. We've used it with great success. Basically, what it allows you to do is alter your, your database schema without having to take any downtime. Self-explanatory. Human factors. Would you guys spend $30,000 on a new piece of hardware if you knew it would increase your uptime by 10%? Yes, okay. I think that we should do the same thing with hiring. I think that this is the most overlooked thing in ops. Basically, we should invest the same amount in people as we do in hardware, if not more. Being patient during hiring to get the right person probably saves tons of nines. It's impossible to quantify, but I'm doing the talking and I think that's true based on experience. <laughs> When bad things happen, you want the best person there to fix the problem, right? So why don't we spend just as much money getting the best person there to fix the problem rather than just waiting until it happens and having someone that's so-so fix the problem? Uh, which leads me to the next thing. Blameless postmortems matter. There's few things more useful to us than actually writing up what happened and learning from it. Uh, we were a little lax about this when I first started because everybody's exhausted when something happens and it's really hard to gather all the information. But the truth is, figuring out the root cause of the problem usually makes it so it's never a problem again. Um, humans invent complicated systems and the complicated systems break and it takes time to figure out what went wrong, why it went wrong. It's never about the who though, it's about the why, right? What allowed this to happen? And I just wanna reinforce that. I've heard it in so many talks, but I still see people not doing this and I'm telling you, you're missing out. All right, recap. Uh, we've got intermission for doing zero downtime, basically stuff behind the scenes. PT online schema change, you don't even need intermission. If you want, you can use MySQL role swap and intermission together. Always deploy CI staging beta in production. Network controls the reachability of your site, right? And don't forget about hiring, guys. It's super important. Bam.